to be moved. The JVP made no distinction between security personnel and civilian collaborators. Bodies left to rot in the hot sun were a common sight. The JVP itself would declare, say, tomorrow nobody goes to work. And nobody did. Everything closed. The JVP at that time was able to bring, certainly the capital and its uh, the suburbs, to a standstill. Some of us, of course, did go to work, because we had to bring the paper out at the time. And uh, I mean, they knew uh, the, the registration numbers of our cars. They knew when we had gone to work. Within a day or two after that, we used to receive letters, death threats. Not even Sri Lanka's top politicians were safe. Colombo was the site chosen for the final rally of Mrs. Bandranayaka, now in opposition, during the 1988 presidential election. Her nervous bodyguards fired wildly into the air. Mrs. Bandanayaka survived unscathed. Bundled away in the nearest car, she went on to lose the election. The eventual winner was Ranasinghe Premadasa. He was a politician of humble origins and he had some sympathy with JVP grievances. In particular, he shared with them an intense dislike of India's military intervention in the North and East. Pramadasa tried his best not to alienate the JVP. He would not say anything against the JVP during his election campaign, and he hoped to turn the JVP to his side. The JVP had imposed a curfew. All the shops were closed. So I confronted the president and asked him, Sir, you are no longer the president of this country. Why don't you take some action? And he said, Neville, um, I know what you're saying, but I do understand the feelings of the JVP. They have a legitimate grievance. They are not employable. They are idealistic youth. We must be tolerant. Like the Sri Lankan army before them, India's troops found the Tigers to be untamable. Delhi had to admit its peacekeeping mission had failed. Under JVP pressure, President Pramadasa told Delhi to pull its troops out, ceding ground to the Tigers. Buoyed by his success with the Indians, Pramadasa now turned on the JVP. The army was called in to track down the ringleaders. Death squads were formed. The disappearances were about to begin. Anybody who was suspected of belonging to the JVP was hauled out of their, mostly in their villages, and taken away, and bodies were either floated down rivers or left burning on piles of tires around the place. The government then adopted a much more draconian approach where it went in and um, simply wiped out large numbers of young people uh, in, in the southern province, uh, many of whom had nothing to do with the JVP or were just innocent, innocents trapped. It was a time of horror. Thousands of young men were thrown into the backs of pickup trucks and never seen again. In the face of strong protests from the diplomatic community, the government denied any knowledge of what was happening. The government itself was reacting to the, the kind of tactics, that the, the measures that the JVP adopted. And the, perhaps that was the only way to do it. Because you, you couldn't let that kind of insurrection continue. Because it was bringing the government to a standstill.
in the end, nobody believed that these disappearances could have happened without government connivance or with the government actually carrying them out. And the assumption has always been that President Premadasa carried this out as a matter of deliberate policy. The Premadasa government finally accepted that there had been human rights violations by the state. I had seen at first hand the way in which the JVP was systematically uh, destroying the government. It was an insuperable problem. It's a kind of problem that some democratic societies have to face from time to time. And resolving it within a democratic framework is not easy at all. The fact is that 40 to 50,000 people, young men, had been destroyed. It took two years to crush the JVP. A whole generation wiped out. No one was prosecuted. For the government, the JVP insurrection was an unwelcome distraction from the war against Tamil separatism. The Sri Lankan army still controlled towns in the north. In men and hardware, the tigers were still easily outnumbered. But away from the towns and main roads, the tigers were consolidating their grip. They were also pioneering a devastating new terror technique. One prominent target, Rajiv Gandhi, the man the Tigers felt had betrayed the Tamil cause by sending in Indian troops. At an election rally in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu, a female suicide bomber squeezed to the front of the crowd and blew herself up. The young Prime Minister of India murdered because of his attempt to end Sri Lanka's ethnic conflict. We had to employ unconventional methods and strategies to fight against state oppression. So we devised these suicide attacks to attack uh, military and economic targets to weaken Sri Lanka. Having eliminated the leader of India, the Tigers now turned their attention back to Sri Lanka. The man who had ruthlessly crushed the JVP posed a clear threat. At a May Day rally in 1993, President Premadasa was assassinated, another suicide bomber. The attacks were totally unacceptable then, they are totally unacceptable now. Resort to suicide bombing at any time, in any form, is inexcusable, totally disruptive of uh, civilized society, in, to in violation of of uh, domestic law in violation of international law and deserves to be uh, con condemned out of hand. In 1994, another member of the Bandranayaka dynasty emerged to hold out the possibility of peace to a war-weary electorate. Chandraka Kumarutunga was the daughter of Solomon Bandranayaka whose language policy had been so disastrous, her mother, Mrs. Bandranayaka, had ruled in the early 60s and 70s. Despite her parents' controversial roles in the conflict, Kumratunga was the first president to acknowledge the failings of previous governments in their dealings with the Tamils. The majority Sinhalese, which constitutes about three-fourths of the total population, did not, until we came into power, accept uh, that the Tamil people and the other minorities, especially the Tamil and the Muslim minority in Sri Lanka, uh, were discriminated against. They preferred to forget uh, and sweep on the carpet that uh, the minorities in Sri Lanka had problems. We came in telling the Sinhala people first that we have to apologize to the minorities of our country for all what we have not done. 